Welcome back to this fourth and final episode of Trauma is a Journey, presented by the Emergency Medical Minute. I'm your host, Elizabeth Esty. In this mini-series on rural trauma, we have followed the journey of two trauma patients involved in a head-on motor vehicle collision on a rural highway high in the mountains of Colorado. In contrast to most car crashes, a group of mountain bikers consisting of two emergency medicine physicians, a pulmonologist, an interventional radiologist, and a real estate developer were on the scene just moments after the crash happened. We continue our discussion of details of our patient's trauma journey, and our providers will discuss their reactions to providing this care and the emotional impacts on all involved. This is a lot of physical trauma, and Dr. Kwan, you're a trauma surgeon, and this is a story about trauma, physical trauma, but it's also, I'm sure, a story about psychological and emotional trauma for the patients, for the other driver, for the family. Could you speak to how you care for that kind of trauma? Yeah, actually, we didn't haven't talked much about the third victim of the accident, who was the driver of the truck. He was the last patient to arrive at Swedish, and um, I actually took care of him briefly in the emergency room. We admitted him overnight for observation, and this was after I had finished operating on the female patient, and both patients were in the ICU already, and when that third patient arrived, and uh, he was an older gentleman, and he um, thankfully was not particularly injured. I think he had a couple of rib fractures, but was doing quite well, but he had a lot of remorse and sadness about the situation, and um, so he was definitely feeling the, the seriousness of the situation that he was in, and then again, after uh, we took care of him, the two patients that were injured, um, their family arrived at the hospital, and I had the opportunity to meet with them um, and to kind of describe the injuries. And, you know, knowing what you guys had gone through on the scene and the amount of effort and that it took to get these patients to the hospital in survivable condition, what we had done to, for them in the OR, what we were currently doing for them in the ICU at that time, and meeting with those family members and basically telling them the worst news they may ever hear in their lives. Um, It was a very emotional moment for them and for me too, but I just was so grateful for the teamwork and all of the efforts of everybody involved uh, that I was able to tell that family that their family members were going to survive. And I remember thinking, boy, at any point, if something had gone wrong or if things hadn't happened the way they did, I could be telling them a very different story and giving them very different news. What do you, trauma surgeons and you intensivists and critical care doctors, do to help patients not be forever scarred by the post-traumatic stress of these experiences? Is that something within the realm of critical care practice? Yeah, I had some similar uh, feelings that Dr. Kwan had, you know, around this time because I think I have had that conversation frequently with the family where the outcome wasn't good. And the the way to help families, you know, get through this, uh, the survivors, is really similar to the way that, that we get through it. Um, we get through it uh, in ourselves by uh, sharing stories with our teammates Frequently, family members um, and patients, uh, I've gone back through to, to show them x-rays about, you know, their own x-rays a month or, or two months prior because they, they don't remember that time and they want to see the date and, and see their x-ray to realize that they were in the hospital. I uh, have had a couple instances where I've seen survivors and, and frequently our survivors don't know the doctors who get cared for them because they're partially there's so many of them and partially because they're unconscious during their illness. And I'm always cautious not to uh, violate any uh, confidentiality, but when the issue comes up in a private setting and uh, patients have asked me, um, I've shared our experience and what it was like to care for them. And I, fa- I think patients uh, find that very helpful to get through. Uh, And the final thing, which I I think is probably the most uh, healing, is for patients themselves to to tell their stories to others. And I think we've all had experiences being in medical conferences where patient survivors are speaking. And 
you can hear a pin drop in a in a large you know thousands of people in a room because we all know the trauma that they've that they've gone through and so um, I think that's one of our most important uh, jobs caring for the entire uh, patient journey. And while this was not a traumatic experience for anyone here, I think the very fact that we're here talking about this speaks to that it was a very powerful experience for all of you. Dylan, you've been the passenger in this kind of collision, and your own experiences with the trauma of a car crash really brought you here where you are today. Would you like to speak to that? Yeah, this is a another personal element of this journey. I was an English major in college and a little bit at loose ends in my senior year because it was pretty clear I was not going to write the great American novel. And the idea that I was going to would be like an English professor at a college somewhere was less and less appealing and I was searching really for something meaningful uh, to do. And I was the restrained front seat passenger in a high-speed rollover uh, MVA over the winter break and ended up in an ICU in Missouri, uh, where we happened to be in that car accident and was, you know, had cervical spine fractures and thoracic spine fractures and liver laceration and a bad head injury and, uh, you know, multiple long bone uh, fractures and was very, very sick for quite a while and had a long recovery. And for me to come back, this is, you know, it's emotional, but, you know, this is literally a, a uh, full circle for my, my career and, and, and trajectory here to come all the way through the decision to go into medicine that really was driven by that experience as a patient and having this intense connection to medicine as a profession because of that and actually EMS you know one of my most visceral memories of being injured in a car accident was uh, it was December and we were partially submerged in a rural river and uh, and I was trapped in the car for a long time it was pretty hypothermic and I remember basically waking up in the helicopter and the main experience of that was just the experience of warmth uh, I think coming into a you know, warm environment um, is, you know, 30 years later is still, you know, in my bones. And that was uh, such a powerful driver of my decision to go into healthcare and to find myself back on a rural highway, you know, with a car accident was, uh, it's hard to explain. Uh, but I, I, I think it's probably obvious. Um, But, you know, one thing to speak to, you know, what Glenda said about trauma, you know, I certainly, I have a good story, you know, I'm fine. And I have, uh, you know, uh, forged a, you know, real meaningful life out of this. But I certainly had a lot of PTSD for a long time, you know, and I, and I imagine our patients will as well. Um, Elizabeth can probably been the victim of that, you know, I could barely tolerate being a car passenger for a long time. And, if you put me in a position of, <clears throat> you know, a nighttime when somebody might fall asleep or something, I mean, it was just like an almost unmanageable level of anxiety that I think I still have, honestly. You know, uh, <laughs> my wife is vigorously nodding her head, but I think it's true. And, and that the PTSD associated with this, I, not to assume that these folks will truly have a PTSD, but this the emotional trauma and the and the fallout from that is significant and i think we're sobered by the uh journey that these folks still have in front of them and we will you know depending on hospital policies and what the powers that be say try to reach out to these patients when they are recovered and home and see if they do want to share their stories because i think that's a perspective it would be wonderful to have yeah, and at Swedish, we have a Trauma Survivors Day uh, once a year. We had to postpone ours this year because of COVID, but it normally happens in May. And we have survivors come and talk about their experiences, about PTSD, about where they are now in their lives, how their experience changed their lives. And they're just so uniformly grateful for the care that they received from you know the scene to uh, ER. And then, of course, they're post-hospital recovery and all the people involved uh, in that. 
but it is an amazing experience to be in a room with survivors of big trauma. And for us, it's sometimes these patients are almost unrecognizable because they were so ill in the hospital and they were so, I mean, they were unconscious, they were ventilated. And to see them tell me stories about how they're skiing again or uh, longboarding and uh, their, you know, their new careers. And it's really uh, humbling to be part of that. And so people do survive and they do get better and they do uh, go back to living very productive lives. Sometimes it's nice to have that reminder because sometimes when they leave the hospital, they are still in the midst of their journey. And to see them come out the other end is an amazing reward. And amazing to hear all of you speak about your the very different journeys to this moment. Jeremiah, I'd love to hear a little more about St. Vincent's and what, after this experience and others probably similar, you have on your wish list for the new hospital and what the new Leadville healthcare landscape is going to look like. No, absolutely. Like you're speaking about, um, you know, we're building a new new facility within Leadville. Um, it's going to be uh, well bigger than the one we have now and far more up-to-date than the one we currently have was built in the 50s um, and has not really been updated very well since. And so we're, you know, the, the building is aging and we just don't have what we need for current Leadville and how Leadville's going to grow. And so the new hospital will have an eight-bed ER, we'll have some surgery capability, we'll have a better CT scanner, um, a much better CT scanner, which will be great. Um, you know, more lab capabilities, more staff. The staff will be centralized in the hospital and uh, just more accessible for the for the entire thing. So um, as far as the list, uh, wish list, I, I think we're already getting it. Yeah. Um, I think we're truly getting the hospital that that level needs and where it's going to bring us into the future for sure. And with the most amazing views of any hospital on the planet. It, it really yeah. is. There's there's Mount Massive and Mount Albert right right out the front door, and it is. It's a it's an incredible view from up there, and it's it's one of the most unique hospitals I've ever seen, um, and I absolutely love working there. So to close our story, JP, you're about to pass out. You may or may not have a firefighter clinging still to your abdomen, stabilizing you. <laughs> Madison, you're muddy and sweaty. I guess you guys aren't that bloody. Dylan, you'd slept, I think, three hours of the previous 40 hours, and none of you had eaten for six hours or so. Luckily, Shane is there, and I I wanted to bring Shane on. I don't know why Shane isn't here to give the perspective of the real estate developer, but Shane kept the reservation. Treeline Kitchen is wonderful. Christine and Eric, thank you for bringing us Treeline. If you're in Leadville, go to Treeline Kitchen. How was dinner? Dinner was phenomenal. And I think, you know, every healthcare provider that has a successful career has somebody in their corner who's there to be a shoulder to cry on or to do the laundry or to receive the call that you're coming in late. And, and in this case, a Shane to uh, take your bikes, go um, uh, lube them up, clean them, and to call the, uh, the reservation in and make sure that you can arrive and get food. Treeline was delicious, uh, and uh, I'll definitely go back. I was going to say, I, th- I also think Shane has some knowledge of the healthcare provider and the sort of this, this, maybe they just won't be home this time because I think his significant other is also an emergency physician. And so it was wonderful to have him helping us there. Dinner was, um, I- I'll be honest with you, the food was phenomenal. The conversation was even better. And the debrief, um, the debrief was so important. And I think we've, I don't know, I think even just talking about it again now brings up back a lot of this stuff and it's so important to talk about it and and it's so important to to get it out and and feel it and it was such a such a rush and in in that dinner it was um wonderful to to talk about it all again re-experience it all again help each other through it uh prevent our own uh trauma from it we so f- forget about all the all the people involved in these things develop you know, an injury in some capacity. And I think we were helping each other heal immediately. Yeah, I I don't know. This comment I'll make maybe gets put in a different part of the podcast. I'm not sure. But I would just say, again, something about burnout. You know, I think it's been said that the antidote to burnout is not usually less work, but it's a full heart. And I think an an experience like this uh, really was something that was – uh, nourishing and anti-burnout, and I think we finished this with a full heart, as I feel today. And one of the great values of this, I think, is again that feeling that we have of community. You know, I've never felt more 
cemented in that community in Leadville. I've never felt more cemented in my community of physicians and my community here at Swedish, in my family. Uh, and um, uh, it was a profound experience. Very grateful for it. JP, what you were saying about uh, being able to talk about it afterwards, being able to debrief that call, um, that's, again, something that we've been going hard on in EMS and, and need to continue going hard on in EMS is really talking that out, uh, minimizing our trauma from those calls. We've seen you know, a, a huge increase in, um, in suicides and PTSD and, and everything in, in EMS. Um, and I, I just want to echo what, what you were saying, which is you know, debrief those calls, get those feelings out, talk to people, be a part of your community, um, and, and really kind of help those, those feelings afterwards. There's such a, a problem with that right now, and I'm sure emergency physicians are a lot of the same way. Um, and and if, we, if we can do that, if we can talk that out, you know, go to people, be a community within that, it's really, really going to help. Thank you, Jeremiah Grantham, paramedic and director of the ambulance service at St. Vincent's. Thank you, Dr. Glenda Kwan, Madison Mocht, Dylan Loyton, and J.P. Brewer. There's a lot of thanks to go around here. Parting thoughts from you all. Dylan. I'd just like to say thank you to the ambulance service at St. Vincent General Hospital and thank you to the community up there for welcoming us in and uh, giving us the opportunity to practice in this environment. It's unique and very special to me. Absolutely, Dr. Layton. Thank you very much for that. Uh, we'd also like to thank, you know, CarePoint and all of you guys who, who showed up on scene. You could have easily sat in the car and, and just watched and see what happened and not jumped in, but you did. And and again, to CarePoint specifically, we've St. Vincent's has come up in the emergency department hugely because of that. Um, we are very, very appreciative uh, for all of the, the help that you've given us and the, the care that you've given our ER um, and all of that as well. Well, if if Car Talk has a funny ending, why can't... We can have a we funny have a ending. Funny ending. We can have a funny ending. Yeah. <laughs> shout out to shout out to Renee Carson for doing all the charting. Yeah. <laughs> because Did I'll you tell you, like, this was crazy. She, she this, was honestly super busy with you guys. She, she was saying later, she was like, I don't know what I would have done if they hadn't shown up. And we, obviously we would have figured it out, but she was yeah. so, so appreciative. Yes, yeah, I, I mean, but I definitely had that moment where we were like, all right, we got a res- <laughs> the restaurant closes at 8. Uh, it's 7.40. I, I was bloody yeah. she had an open hand I think it's an yeah. open hand fracture and I had like yeah. all of my clothes and, yeah. and we had to like run to my house thank god Shane had done yeah. the bikes and I remember saying to Renee I'm like D- I can come back and chart like what you? and she's like nope get out yeah. and yeah. we were just like yeah. we're out and yeah. she did all those charts that is pretty big it's pretty incredible yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. Do we have time? Yeah, yeah, we got time. Let's save the world. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome. So, Jeremiah, what's in uh, what's in your go bag? Um, it sounds like uh, uh, you carry less now. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, I generally carry things uh, kind of like Dylan was saying: a stop the bleed kit, a uh, tourniquet, uh, you know, something like that. Maybe a BVM or a pocket mask, but that's really about it. Yeah, it reminds me of uh, that movie uh, John Wick, where uh, or many martial arts movies where there's you know, kind of spontaneous use of objects around uh, in order to defend oneself or to kill somebody. Like John Wick, you know, kills somebody with a book. You know, so maybe maybe we should all be more uh, better at improvising with the equipment we have there. And what's more, really more important is the the knowledge behind it. It just, I think, as you say that, duct tape fixes everything. thank you all so much for being here Uh, I'd also like to thank CarePoint and Health One for generously supporting the Emergency Medical Minute a special thanks to Renee Carson who did all the charting while these guys were eating dinner and of course thanks to John Wick 3 Melanzana's excellent masks Eric and Christine at Treeline Kitchen and duct tape and thank you (laughs) for listening